Maybe we should start. Get things going. So today we have Lisa Everett from University of Wisconsin. Um, Lisa got her PhD at University of Pennsylvania. From there, she had a postdoc at the University of Michigan. Then she moved to CERN, and then she moved back to the U.S. and went to the University of Florida. <coughs> While at Florida, she had a L'Oreal for Women in Science Postdoctoral Research Award. And also, in 2017, she was elected as an APS Fellow. And the citation was for con contributions to physics beyond the standard model and the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking with an emphasis on seeking connections between the often disparate bounds of observable particle physics and fundamental theory. Yes. So <clears throat> Lisa is one of the world experts in like model building. So she often, Casey and I oftentimes work bottom up and she oftentimes works top down. So you're gonna have two points of view on working at these sorts of things. But today she'll tell us about beyond the standard model physics and the LHC error. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first I wanted to thank uh, Ian and others for the opportunity to be here today. I've had a really great day meeting a number of you and talking to you. And for the students in the room, it's probably also good if you know that I first met both Ian and Casey when they were students themselves. And so even though all of us are a little grayer now and some of us are a little more weathered, let's say, I still think of them as young students so I can pretend the time has not passed in the way that it appears to have done. Okay. All right, so I'm happy to be here today to tell you about beyond the center model physics in the LHC era. Um, let's just start with the things that we know, which is that the LHC era is really a fantastic time for physics. Okay? The thing that I've been actually talking about a number of times today, meeting with various colleagues here, is that when I was a graduate student, I first got into high energy theory right after the superconducting super collider was canceled. And so there was a long period in which there wasn't an influx of experimental data and the future was uncertain. Right. And so the fact that we have this machine operating and doing such a fantastic job, okay, here, I, I'm from Madison where we have both Atlas and CMS, so we have to have both on every possible slide, otherwise, you know, <laughs> stuff happens, okay? <laughs> so just so you know, prepare. So, so we see, you know, here's sort of how the ex machines have been doing. There's been an incredible amount of data, many analyses, and as I'm sure a lot of you know, there's the Morian conferences in the spring, the ski conferences where they release all the new data and there's, there were a lot of new analyses including run two data. Very often some new results with that and we're going to eagerly anticipate many more. And as we know, we're still at the beginning of this era, right? There's a long-term plan and you know, if you can read this, then you have better vision than I do, okay? But we also know this figure from many places. It's been all around. It's sort of the long-term strategy for how we're gonna go from the LHC to sort of upgrades and et cetera, and maybe eventually some high intensity or high energy upgrades eventually. And the overarching goals, of course, are testing and completing the standard model and really answering an important question, which is, is there new physics at the TEV scales that are probed by the LHC in this unprecedented era where we actually be able to do this. So we always have to have the obligatory slide on the standard model, I'll try to keep it brief, okay? So here's some nice picture of all the particles and we all know about them, the three generations of the quarks and leptons, the gauge bosons, and now there's the Higgs. Actually, I like one of those other figures, I should replace this one with um, you know, the one where it's a circle and the Higgs is right in the middle. I personally like that one a lot better, but since I'm not a good figure drawer myself, I steal whatever's the first image that shows up on the Google search, so I think this was the one. And as we know, it's based on the gauge principle, right? SU3 color, SU2 left, U1 hypercharge, and the electroweak group is broken by the Higgs, down to SU3 color and U1 electromagnetism, right? Now, I'm gonna define the standard model according to this particle content. There's some semantics related issue as to how you define, how you incorporate neutrino masses, right? In its bare bones inception, where we have just these sort of particles and no, you know, maybe some statement that it's only renormalizable couplings and there's no neutrino masses in the standard model, but we've now see that there are neutrino masses, but you can easily add that by either adding new particles of some sort, or you can relax the idea that we have only up to renormalizable operators because we can generate neutrino masses, for example, from you know, this particle content at the renormalizable level. But so having said all that, and I like neutrino masses a lot, which is why I said as much as I did, we're not gonna talk about them that much more here 
because their importance for collider studies is relatively minimal unless you want to really go by beyond and extend this in particularly dramatic ways. Okay, so we also have the Higgs sector, right? In many ways, for many years, one thought we're just parameterizing ignorance. Right? We need to break the electroweak symmetry. This is sort of the simplest way to do it. And as we know, the potential is sort of put in by hand. Okay. But what we know also now, since this inception of this theory and the idea of spontaneous symmetry breakdown and the Higgs mechanism, we now know this is the spectacularly successful theory. And it's so successful, we almost don't know what to do with ourselves. Right? It's basically just as robust so far as robust can be. I like this figure because, first of all, it's talking about all of our old friends, the elementary particles, basically, and the time scale over which one was sort of thinking about them conceptually to discovering them. I also like it because I think it's here somewhere. The source for this is The Economist, which I thought was really weird. <laughs> you know, I remember thinking, like, really, they were talking about that? I haven't been able to find the article where they were actually talking about it, but I, I intend to someday. Okay. But it's a nice picture of sort of how certain things came about and how, for example, our friend the Higgs conceived of in the 1960s and discovered, of course, relatively recently, a much longer time frame. And so, of course, we can also notice that the LHC, I mean, as I said, I love this having sort of been a young student and postdoc in a time when you were sort of wanting more influx of data. It was always fantastic when the LHC was on and suddenly they're rediscovering various old friends, right, through various resonance peaks and back in one, this is an old figure from 1-1. One one. And then, of course, now we have a sort of Morion updated 2019 CMS slide with all the standard model production cross sections. And we can see just the huge number of different things. Again, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I need glasses and I'm in denial. So I can't really read all this stuff. But you can just see the huge number of different possible channels that have been looked at. Okay. And so far, the standard model is really reigning supreme. If you think about what this theory prediction, these bars are, what we see, we're right in there generally on almost everything. So it's really quite something. Of course, there's the shining moment of the Higgs discovery back in 2012, which was truly exciting, right? And so here are the old papers from that time frame and the first initial things, right? We have all seen this picture, right, of the people that were involved in the Higgs mechanism. Of course, Anglaire and Higgs got the Nobel Prize for this in 2013. Right? And there were a number of other key players, including Braut, who was Anglaire's collaborator. Unfortunately, he died before the Nobel Prize was conferred. And then Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble, who were also very important figures in there. And I mentioned Anderson, even though you know, he was sort of talking about spontaneous symmetry breakdown outside of the Minkowski sort of space context, but he did it earlier than these other folks. Okay. So this is sort of a triumphant thing to have this paradigm realized. Right? It puts to rest certain notions about you know, what is it that's breaking the electric symmetry. We see there is some object. It's all circumstantial evidence pointed to the idea that there would be such a thing, but it's still fantastically incredible to actually see this thing. And let's talk about our friend the Higgs boson, who's, let's face it, still a young kid, right? Elementary school age now, okay, through the years. And if we think about post-run one, already we're doing pretty well with the Higgs mass measurement. So these were, you know, combined analysis taken well after the run one stopped, right? And we have various, you know, Higgs couplings and et cetera. And, you know, here's some of these kappa, what is it, fermions, so the, this blob representing couplings of the Higgs to fermions, and another blob, kappa V, the couplings to the gauge bosons, et cetera. And we have various combinations of the data. And so basically there, there was a lot of already there, a number of measurements of couplings of the Higgs to the fermions and the gauge bosons. There was vector boson fusion and decay to tau pairs already observed at greater than five sigma confidence, right? Even just post run one before run two. Generally excellent performance by both experiments in doing all this. There's a number of reports you can see where they have all these things summarized. And let's think about it. And now in 2009, here's the current mass value that, for example, was unleashed at Morion, okay? And you know, this doesn't necessarily include all the run two data. This is the current number based on some run two data, et cetera. And so here's certain examples of very recent analyses. So here's some Higgs to ZZ star to four leptons, and then this new sort of CMS result. There's Atlas sort of associated production with top pairs, and you can see this thing. And again, more and more zeroing down on the couplings, et cetera. And you can say continued really great performance. We've 
well established the Higgs and the gauge boson decays, established the Yukawa couplings are happening to third generation. And furthermore, although the details of the standard model Higgs couplings to other particles still need to be measured to much greater precision, so far things look very much like a standard model looking Higgs. There's wiggle room for this, of course. But it's either standard model or very standard model-like, meaning what's, what's often called aligned. Meaning if you have many more objects, et cetera, there's some linear combination that sort of is playing the role of the standard model Higgs. And of course, there's much more of these analysis to come with the complete run to data set and analysis that's going to be happening. So lots more to look forward to. And so let's talk about the Higgs mechanism, which we should do, right? So here's the, uh, here's the basic assumption. We have this scalar field that I'm calling capital H here. I might call it little a, well, I guess little h is down here, okay? And so what do we do? We postulate it to be the simplest possible thing that can break electric symmetry, which is to make it a doublet. And we can write it in this sort of suggestive way in terms of the goldstones and the generators. So I'll return to this parameterization much later. So here's the physical state, here's the vacuum value. And as we well know, if you sort of have this potential, if you arrange the parameters properly, you can then get this thing to break and you can minimize it. The goldstones are eaten. This is some cute image made by people who are good at cute images. This is Flip Tenedo. He has a lot of nice lectures on this stuff if people are interested that are gauged at a general audience and I think are very nicely done. And so the goldstones then are eaten, right? We have the VEV related to the Fermi constant, so it's fixed. We get sort of fixed values of the um, W and Z gauge bosons. And in particular, what you can say, if this is our assumed Higgs potential after we expand it around the minimum, right, from here, then we can get basically the Higgs mass in terms of these parameters and post Higgs discovery, pre Higgs discovery, we didn't know the mass because we didn't know the lambda. We knew the V, but we didn't know the lambda. Post Higgs discovery, we know the mass. So if you like, you can retrofit it back to this potential and you can say, okay, then this mu squared over here should be an order of this size and this lambda should be like so. And you think, isn't this great? We've learned so much already. But let's just comment that we don't really know, right, whether that standard model Higgs potential is the real potential or not. What have we measured? We measured some particle existing with some particular mass. So what that is is really the minimum of some potential, whatever it is. We've measured fluctuations about that little minimum. So we've measured basically things around here, but we haven't gotten the full global picture of the potential at all, right? This is just the very beginning. And so it may not be the correct thing. So we can't just go back, for example, to this thing back here that I was just talking about and be like, okay, we already fixed all this stuff. We already know everything. We don't know. We've measured some fluctuations about a minimum and we need to know, for example, further issues. For example, when we go back and look at this object, here are things like the couplings of three Higgs to themselves. So this triple Higgs coupling, which is a very important thing to try to measure to confirm or not the consistency of the standard model assumptions for the Higgs potential. And then also there's a quartic, which is even harder to measure, you can imagine. Because now instead of having to th handle three Higgses, you need to have four. Oops. And so, you know, I'm not an expert in the details of what you need to get to all these things, but my understanding is the triple Higgs coupling, we really need to be at some high luminosity LHC. And the quartic is just very, very hard. And whenever you ask various people, and I'm happy to have various people weigh in on this, either after or during or whatever, it seems like people are always like, oh, that's at least a decade away at least a decade away. And that sort of happens no matter when you ask that question, <laughs> okay? So in other words, it's hard, but if you really want to test that this is the potential, you need to know all those things because these things have to be related in very particular ways, okay? So experimentally, it's very challenging, but it's important to try to confirm the standard model Higgs picture, okay? So the point is, even though it sort of looks like a standard model Higgs, smells like one, walks and talks and quacks like a duck like one, we don't know for sure, and experimentally, we have to over-constrain to try to figure this out. Okay, so it may lead to surprises, okay? And so let's go back now that we think about the Higgs and let's talk about all the successes of the standard model. And as I said, up to neutrino masses, which aren't hard to accommodate, the issue is how to uh, handle the many different possible plethora of ways to accommodate them, okay? It ag agrees with all the particle physics data to date. There are a few anomalies here and there with flavor sector, I might get to that at the very end. Okay, but I would say the story there is not fully completed yet. We're not quite there to know if they're really there or not. Okay, but putting those things aside, we can see the main success is really the triumph of this idea of the gauge principle. So QED and then the <coughs> structure of the electroweak, Ws and Zs, spontaneous symmetry breaking, right, et cetera. And so, you know, it's really this gauge principle triumph. And so 
you know, Tuft was right, I suppose, to be under the spell of it. Actually, he's right about pretty much everything, it seems. Okay. But the problem is, is that despite all these great successes, there are many problems that the standard model just doesn't address at all. Okay. And that doesn't take anything away from all these successes. Okay. The successes of the standard model and the gauge principle are largely orthogonal to the problems. Right? So it's not like you can say, well, because all this is successful, those other problems, there's no big issue. No, there, there, there are big issues. They're just not covered by the gauge principle, generally. Okay? So let's talk about them. So I like to put them into three general categories. Okay? First one is the aesthetics. Okay? And so this was something, the purple quote of too complicated and arbitrary was something that my, one of my own thesis advisors, Paul Anker, kept saying again and again. Too complicated and arbitrary. Many parameters. You, we've had many more measurements than parameters. We can fit them all, et cetera. Okay? But there's all sorts of things like, why do we have this gauge structure? Why do we have the quantum numbers we do? Why do we have CP violation in the way that it comes in? Why are there three families? What is the origin of all the fermion masses and mixings? Okay? So all these are not addressed, and they're not covered or explained by the gauge principle. Now there's also the naturalness, which is going to be the main topic of what I'm talking about. And I use this word knowing it's a loaded word, and we're going to talk about that. Okay? But the idea here is really what's going on with in terms of the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking. And in particular, now that we know there's a Higgs of some sort, the origin of the light Higgs mass and what the vacuum structure of the theory really looks like. Okay? And finally, there is a series of cosmological issues, dark matter, dark energy, blah, 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 right? Okay. All of these, okay, appear to need physics beyond the standard model to address them, okay? Okay, here comes the first of many slides where I'm going to hand wave to you and try to sell you stuff, okay? But since I try deeply to be an honest person, I'm going to tell you when I'm trying to sell you things. So the idea here is just to get some sense as to where might we expect the physics that comes in to handle some of these problems, where might it come? And because it's about expectations, these all have theoretical biases and prejudices in them. So let me just say what I think they are. And that's going to end up being why I'm going to talk about why there's been so much focus on this idea of naturalness and physics at TeV scale. Okay. So the aesthetic problems, okay, typically one expects, if you think, okay, when might the scales of new physics come in? Okay. I would say for a number of the aesthetic issues, some of them we really don't have that much of a handle on at all like why the three families or whatever. Whatever that might be, it would be some other theory beyond that sort of says it must be three unless something else happens. We're not really there, including in string theory or other attempts to go beyond, right? There were some ideas that you can relate that to certain topological properties of a compactification manifold. That's true in certain contexts, but it hasn't been fully fleshed out and realized in some way to make that more precise, okay? But what thing we do know, for example, if you think about the flavor puzzle, that's the origin of all the fermion masses and mixings. If you try to bring down whatever physics is that's com coming up with those things down to scales that are accessible by experiments, TeV or lower, then what generally happens is that the structure of the standard model which says that certain neutral current processes are rare, that they change, that the ones that change flavor are very, very rare, and they're rare in a way that's very precisely understood in the standard model. And you put in new physics and make it accessible and allow it to change flavor so that it can generate fermion masses and mixings which have to change flavor, then what's going to happen is generically you're going to be in major trouble and you're going to overproduce rare decay production that you, you know and you have measured are not there. Okay? So again, the idea being that most likely to avoid some of these things, it's most likely that whatever that physics is, it is a much higher scale. There's also ideas, again, all theoretical prejudice, but there's a number of sort of conspiracy that means that usually when we look at these problems, we work in a much higher energy domain. Okay? Now, what about, let's go to cosmology. Okay. Now, there are many, many, many possibilities here, and I can't say that much. Okay. So dark matter is probably the number one place where people start trying to make arguments for order TeV, but there can also be arguments for larger or smaller, right? It's really all the way out there. Same with the matter antimatter asymmetry. It could be TeV, it could also be much, much larger. Okay? It could be all over the map, right? That's the point. And so one of the things that sort of made a lot of focus here on the idea of understanding sort of the electroweak symmetry breaking sector better and the Higgs, right, is basically that one can expect, quote, okay, if you want to make this thing understandable from the point of view of some principle, 
then there was this idea always that we should be able to have physics that should be in some reach of a collider that's probing the TeV scale. And this is an effective theory argument, and it's called the gauge hierarchy problem. I'm going to get to it in a moment. Okay. So I'm going to focus here on naturalness, okay, in part because this is the domain where we think that the collider input can tell us more about what we learn or don't learn about it. And the issue is always stated in many different ways, and many of them can seem misleading, so I'm going to sort of try to navigate through this. Here I'm trying to not be super technical about it, because I think it's in the sort of super technical statements that one can then sort of be a little bit misled and talk about divergences. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but the idea is really, why is the Higgs so light, and what's the origin of the electric scale? So here's some inputs that we already have. Okay. And so at the heart of the issue is really two basic ingredients. First is there's one high scale, and I'm calling it capital M. M is much larger than electroweak, supposedly. So we already know, for example, there's a Planck scale, right? That's bigger, right? So we know high scales are going to exist. We could also imagine there might be other scales. So one scale that could be there but maybe isn't is a gut scale. There could be other scales that we could construct or concoct. Okay, but suppose there's something that's higher. And then we can work in the framework of effective field theory, okay? Where the idea is the following, okay? And basically, I'm having a whole slide on this because I think it's important to understand why the paradigm of sort of thinking about effective theories has taken hold so much, okay? So the idea is obviously what we really want is some fundamental description, okay? Much like sort of a Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism where from everywhere you can calculate everything, okay? But even if you, you know, even if you might have it, and I would say we're far from that, okay? you can often achieve enormous simplification from doing an effective description. So the idea being, physics basically is forgetting about certain energy scales as you zo zoom in on the areas that you want. So for example, we don't need to know the full relativistic theory to think about what happens if I take this laser pointer and drop it on the floor. We can use Newtonian physics for that. And that's because ultimately it doesn't care about those microscopic details. Right, we can essentially what we call integrate those things out. So the idea is physics is forgetting about degrees of freedom at very short distances generally. Okay? Whatever that high scale physics is, this UV physics is going to be encoded in these parameters. Okay? So what you can do is you can work in an effective description where you measure those parameters and from there you try to figure out how you go from there to what some next level that's predicting those parameters. And I say this has been called the most important idea in physics because when I was taking quantum field theory at UPenn many moons ago, my professor kept talking about this again and again, okay? Was that ultimately what we care about is this, right? As opposed to thinking something's fundamental like the standard model and going all the way up to some infinitely high scale, okay? And so this is the issue that then gives us some issue with the idea of a fundamental scalar and why its mass is very sensitive to high scale physics. So here's the general idea in these effective theories. So here's energy going up. Here's the high scale capital M, and then you're going to have both heavy and light states, so you sort of integrate them out. You take these Lagrangian with both, and you integrate out the ones that are of this order, and you're going to get some set of renormalizable couplings that involve the light, and you're going to also have non renormalizable ones and a tower of them. So even if this is some sort of just renormalizable theory up here, when you integrate out, you're going to get some tower of objects. So you get an effective theory at your low scale. These non-renormalizable objects are suppressed by inverse powers of M, whatever that thing is. And then you can compute quantum corrections using this effective theory description. So for example, I'm going to just tell you the standard way this is presented, okay? And then we'll talk about why there's some confusion sometimes with the standard way and why we have to understand precisely what we're doing. So you can calculate loops. And so for example, one natural thing is to cut off the scale at some capital M. Okay? Because we know already that at M, these whole set of things, which often we neglect, are going to come in and be operational. And if we do that and we look at scalars, we can see that the scalar masses get corrections, okay? and their corrections go like the heavy mass squared, and there's also a log piece, whereas the fermions only have the log piece. Okay? And so this is often commented as quadratic divergences, because if we take M goes off to infinity, Right, we're going to get this sort of big correction that we're going to have to subtract off. Okay? Whereas over here we have log, and log is much softer. Okay? So the idea is that scalar masses seem to be highly sensitive to whatever physics there is at the very, very high scale. Okay? And let me just comment that even though I'm talking here about making this cutoff scale M, very often people get confused because then they say, look, 
I can use a different renormalization scheme like dimensional regularization. And if I get that, then this m squared term doesn't show up. So what are you talking about with all this quadratic divergence stuff? And the answer is the UV sensitivity is there no matter what scheme you use to calculate observables. Because whatever observables are, they have to be independent of the scheme. The point is whatever calculations you do, it may be at some intermediate sort of step, you get things like this, which sort of highlight the difficulty right there and smack you in the face with it, whereas others, they're a little bit more obscure. But the main idea is that when you're calculating these things and including corrections, what's going to happen is that the scalars are much, much more sensitive to the high scale physics than the fermions are. Okay? And you know that's a big issue. Here's the standard thing in that same cutoff language where basically you talk about the corrections to the Higgs mass. This is just standard model. You probably have seen all this stuff many, many times. And so the question is then, given that you're going to have all this stuff, here's the m squared, and then there's the coefficient. And so you need to have some sort of sensitive cancellation if, say, this m is very high up near Planck or God or some very high value. Okay. And like I said, this general issue was understood for many, many years. We've all long known that if there was a Higgs that was a fundamental scalar, this is going to be some kind of issue. Why is this so compelling? Okay. It's because obviously it's been compelling because people have been focusing on this idea of like natural Higgs, natural Higgs for such a long period. Okay. And so usually what one often says is that this light Higgs mass, you can think of it as being in some sort of unstable equilibrium. So an analysis that I've seen, I think it was Leon Tao Wong was one of the people sort of pushing this picture, and I agree. Sort of like, imagine things being in some unstable equilibrium. So if you imagine that you have some pencil and it's just standing upright on its point, just right there on the desk, right? And then you're like, well, why is it doing that? Nothing's holding it up, right? So you might think there must be something that we can't see holding it up, making it do that, okay? As opposed to what you expect it to do, which was to topple over and lie down flat, right? I personally like my own. It's a little bit imprecise, but I like this sort of do you know, I don't know if you guys know about this flip over top. If you don't, you should all go out and get one right after this talk is over. Because this thing, and I, if I was less technologically fearful, okay, I would try to embed a movie of this thing spinning. Because this thing is amazing. When you spin it, what happens is it's spinning around. And then what happens is this thing starts going like this. And it flips. And eventually, it flips over completely. It spins standing up on the, this edge. And then it sort of does a little bit of this. And then it finally plops over. Okay, so it's much better than like a fidget spinner or whatever these other things are. So all of you who are young and like worried about your careers and lives and the future and all that and you're nervous, like this is a great soother. Okay, I spun this thing endlessly when I was a postdoc in Florida where I first saw this thing. Okay, and so in fact, you know, you might say, oh, you know, I was tempted to put Lagrangian down for this thing. Actually, it's a hideous mess. Okay, and it's intrigued physicists and many. So there's there's a picture I actually saw a Bohr and Pauli staring at this thing flipping over. You know, they were like, check this out. My God. Yeah. So you can do it. It's it's as with most classical mechanics. Often it's just some complicated mess, right? But it inverts and then it topples. And then so I say, imagine that you spin it, and then it flips and it sort of stops, with this thing up and it's just spinning and then suddenly it just that's it. Then you'd be like, why is that happening? Right? That's not how physics should work. It's in this unstable. It should be toppling or spinning or something. And I say this because, believe it or not, this actually happened to me once again in Florida. Casey knows. Okay. I was taking a top like this, which had a flat thing. And I was spinning it, and it was on a mouse pad. OK, graduate students in the room, a mouse pad is sort of like a foam thing. And you suppose, okay, anyway, <laughs> okay. we can discuss later. Or you can Google it. Okay. It's some archaic thing people used to have when you had these. OK, <laughs> right. And so I had this big one on my desk. And I was just spinning this thing, nervous about jobs and life. And then suddenly, it just stopped right there. And of course, there were many conspiracies. It was like a surface with friction. This was flat. It could do it. It was a very well-machined thing. It was a very nice one. Okay. And I remember just sitting there looking at it, just going, this cannot be. How did it do this? Actually, I was able to reproduce that several more times over the time I was a postdoc, maybe two or three more times after spending it hundreds more times. Okay. But this is the kind of thing, when you see something like that, it just begs for some sort of explanation. And I think the reason why I'm telling you all this, besides educating you about how you need to go and buy one of these things right away, is that it's partly why this idea of trying to understand what's giving this Higgs mass this light value has captivated people so much, and you might say almost too much, being convinced that we can know exactly how it's happening and through what mechanism, and that there could be a no-lose theorem for why you should see new states. 
Okay. I will claim there is no no-lose theorem because we don't know exactly what's going to be the mechanism to do it, but we believe there is something somewhere. Okay. And then different ideas have been proposed and taken light in different contexts, and we'll talk about sort of the history of how that developed. Okay. And you can see why people got enamored of certain paradigms because of how they can try to address this precise issue with physics that you might be able to reach at experiments that we can actually do now. Okay? All right, so here's the standard explanation. Basically, standard lore is that, look, this is the top loop that's the main big contribution. And so, basically, when you have that, you need something that's going to counterbalance the thing. Okay? And so, suppose we have a top partner. This is a standard lore. Top core causes a big correction. Let's have a partner that cancels it. Okay, the other standard model contributions don't look like they should be the right size to cancel it. Okay, and so how do you get such cancellations? Well, you want to have a symmetry. And indeed, what you really want to do is you want to impart the scalar masses with a symmetry to protect their mass. And that's not so easy because if you stare at this mass term for a scalar, it goes like absolute value of phi squared. So simple symmetries aren't going to cut it. Okay, compare the fermions, right? Fermions have this type of mass term, and we know that as you take this mass parameter in the fermion sector to zero, you have an enhanced symmetry, which is called chiral symmetry. Now, you can do independent rotations of the left and right-handed states that make up this mass term. Okay? You don't have that for the scalars. And so what you want is some way to do this, and it doesn't come out naturally. Okay? It's not something that's just going to come you know, for free with anything you think about. You have to make this happen, okay? or ex examine ways in which you can make this happen. So I'm going to talk about it in two contexts. Okay? One is the one that many of us have heard about. I've worked much on this. Okay? And the idea here is that the symmetry is going to be a symmetry that relates bosons and fermions. And so in this context, what's going to happen is that the Higgs mass is going to inherit the chiral symmetry that the fermions enjoy through supersymmetry transformations. So that's the way we can understand why supersymmetry can help control the Higgs mass. Okay, I say help because there's many caveats to this, as we'll talk about in great detail. Okay, there's another set of models that I'm not as familiar with, but I think they're actually extremely interesting, so I wanted to talk about them in some depth too. And that's the composite Higgs models. And the idea here is that suppose now we have some new big global symmetry in the theory. One way to get some light state, some light scalar, is for it to be a pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson associated with the breaking of that symmetry. If you have an exact symmetry, the Goldstone boson is going to be a massless state. So what you have to have is something where that symmetry is not fully exact, but actually explicitly broken in some controlled way, such that you have not a true Goldstone boson, which is massless, which is not the Higgs, right? but a pseudo one where we can try to understand the origin of that 125 GeV through this explicit breaking. Okay? And so the point is, in this set, the top partner is this is basically this scalar partner of the top, or the stop, we call it, right? Because everybody has a different spin counterpart in supersymmetry. And now in the composite Higgs scenario, now the top partner is going to be some new state, and generally it's also a fermion. Okay? And it's going to be model dependent. I'll talk a little bit about the, the different possibilities. Okay? So let's talk again about searching for new physics. And I like this slide so much that even though it's from 2015, I just can't let it go, <laughs> okay? And so, the executive summary, we haven't found it. That's still true, okay? I also like this one from Morion 2017. Lots and lots and lots of data and lots and lots and lots of searches. And I know Werner Porod pretty well and he's an excellent guy and I thought, wow, I'm so happy he overlaid them all for me so I didn't have to do that myself, okay? Here's some recent analyses. Okay, this is some very recent results. Again, you see how I have to like balance Atlas and CMS, otherwise I have to hand in my University of Wisconsin Mad Madison ID card and you know go jobless and search for a different career. Okay, so here's an Atlas sort of Susie summary and it's densely packed with all kinds of information. Here's CMS exotics, right? Here is which is this one? I think this is a Gluino, right? And Squark, right? Various different types of limits. And again, this is just some sampling of things that were you know, laid out either in Morion 2019 or before. And there's going to be many, many more as more and more run-to data is analyzed, you know, put through the mill. Okay? 
All right, so that's where we are. What are the implications? Okay. The first thing that we all know, okay, and when you work on models of these things, it becomes very clear. The limits are quite stringent, right? But they also involve many assumptions. They can involve assumptions of simplified model spectra. They don't all. They can involve ideas that various masses are degenerate or not. You can have prompt decays or not. There's a number of different issues. So the point is when you look at the limits, you can't sort of assume that because it says over there that this thing stops at this thing that your model may not satisfy the assumptions put into this. Okay? But all of that doesn't really matter because it's not like it's very easy to suddenly be like, well, my model can do whatever it wants. Guess what? It can't. Okay? The limits are stringent. You have to reinterpret them in the context of whatever you're looking at specifically, but no matter how you view it, there's a major challenge to the idea that whatever the new physics is is setting the scale in some way that's just paradigm dependent. Okay? So that's the theme. And we're going to explore what this means for SUSY, mostly because that's the area I know more about. And then I'll talk a little bit about the composite Higgs framework and what it means. OK, let's talk about supersymmetry. This is, again, a slide probably many of you have seen at various points in life. And if not, if this is the first time, well, I'm glad to be the one to first show you this thing. OK? It seems like it's always there and never going away. We'll talk about that, too. I'm going to focus here on the minimal supersymmetric standard model. There's different non-minimal versions to talk about. The idea is this particular type of supersymmetry called n equals 1. So there's a partner for each particle. Here some of them are listed. There's two Higgs doublets that's required by supersymmetry. We have to have more than one. Okay? The ratio of the VEVs of the two, U and D, is some, the parameter called tan beta, and you're going to see that parameter a lot. Okay? And the, the suggestive notation is indeed true. The HU couples to uptype quarks. The HD couples to downtype quarks. It also couples to charged leptons. Okay? And this is actually important because once you have more than one Higgs doublet, if they couple arbitrarily, then what's going to happen is you're going to have Higgs-mediated rare decays, and that's another big no-no. Okay? They also have something called conserved R parity. What this means in practice is that all the standard model particles have one charge and all their partners have a different one. That means the lightest one can't decay into two standard model particles, no matter how much heavier it is. Okay? And this thing, realization why you had to have this, by the way, is because if you don't have it, you can write down dimension four operators that mediate proton decay, which is an absolute disaster. Okay, it means the proton would have decayed like yesterday. Okay? So that can't happen. But when people realize you can have this parity, then it turned out, wait, this stable object, well, that's a nice paradigm for some dark matter particle that still has to be around because it can't possibly decay into other stuff. Okay? I think part of why supersymmetry sort of took such root in the dark matter domain, and this is all I'm going to say about it, okay, is because I would say that this idea of the parity in this context of this new 100 GeV to TeV scale physics, that this thing probably first <coughs> appeared in the context of supersymmetry model fixing. And later on, when people looked at other paradigms, realized, well, it's actually very easy in those paradigms, and often you need it to have parity in some other setting. So whatever the new states are, they have a different charge from the standard model, and you have the same issue. OK, yeah? Uh, is there a Quick explanation for why there's four Higgs enos and five Higgs bosons. Yes. So there are four Higgs enos because what happens is that the gauge eno particles, so there's a you know hypercharged gauge eno and SU2 left, those mix with the Higgs after the electroweak symmetry breaking and stuff is over. So what you have are basically four degrees of freedom here that mix. And there's going to be two that have charge, and then there's going to be four that have neutral. And so that's how you get the four. And as for the five Higgs, it's because what happens is when you have two complex doublets, there's eight degrees of freedom. Three are even, but to make the longitudinal components of the W and the Z, so you have five leftovers. So the light, so there's two CP evens. One of them you take to be the 125 GeV Higgs. It's standard to think that's the lightest one. Okay, and, the, and originally people thought, well, maybe that's the heavier one. Maybe there's an even lighter one hiding that's harder to see. Okay, that seems less and less likely. I don't think it's 100% ruled out. Okay, and then there's a charge takes pair. And there's also a CP odd neutral one. Okay, so they can be classified if you assume that the Higgs potential conserves CP. If it violates CP, the various neutral states all mix. Okay, but that's the explanation. Okay, and here are the couplings. And the point is, these are the Yukawa couplings. And the idea is in supersymmetry, the supersymmetric ones, meaning the particles and their partners all enjoy these things, they are encoded in something called the superpotential. There's also a mass parameter for the Higgses that's here, it's going to come back to haunt us later. And then there's the fact that the supersymmetry has to be broken. 
because if it wasn't, then what would happen is that the particle and the partner would have to have the same mass. And that means the electron would have to have a spin zero charged friend, the selectron, with the exact same mass as the electron. And guess what? That's not here, okay? Atomic physics would be extraordinarily diff different if such a thing were around, okay? So we know we have to break it. And the breaking sector is gonna be where all the Pandora's box opens, okay? Because if you just have the supersymmetric part, you get those Higgs mass corrections all cancel out and everything seems to be perfect. And what happens then is if you break it in some explicit way that you might imagine from some higher theory point of view results from a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry, what will happen is those Higgs corrections are gonna depend on the overall scale of whatever these partner masses are, okay? All right. And so here's all the ingredients as I talked about. Let me just keep on going, right? This is exactly what I just said, so let me move on. And so here's what the supersymmetry breaking parameters look like. So here's the gauge partners. These are spin one half, okay? One, two, three for U1, SU2, SU3. This is the supersymmetric version, supersymmetry breaking version of the, Higgs you know, the Higgs mass parameter. Here's couplings among the scalar objects, the partners of the quarks and the leptons, they can couple with trilinears, and then they have mass squares, and everybody can have flavor indices. So this is actually a lot if you really start counting. If you count and let the arbitrarily general supersymmetry breaking sector in there, then there's enormous number of new parameters. And so right away you can say, this is completely crazy. So we're adding this thing in, and then it's got 100 parameters, and you know, 100 parameters to explain this one thing, okay? And that's absolutely true. Although I'll argue that of these 100 parameters, there's, only, there's about 20 that are relevant for the issue at hand. The rest are related to flavor mixing and CP violation. Okay, and those are their own Pandora's box to open and deal with. Generally, if those are around in order one, you're doomed by various flavor changing rare processes, but the limits again depend very much on which process and what thing, and they're very complicated. And in fact, this parameter space is so vast and so complicated, I would say despite, you might think, what seem to be an enormous number of papers on supersymmetry, we don't really have a complete cartography of what the viable parameter space is. What we have to do is try to get a handle on it, and now that we have LHC to probe this thing, what we want to do is make sure we're covering all the relevant regions, okay? So, okay, I just said that. Here are the parameters that are relevant for colliders, okay? And so there's actually 19 of these as written here, okay? This set of parameters is now given a name. They call it the phenomenological MSSM, meaning those are the things that are gonna be relevant for collider phenomenology. And there are some brave souls out there at Slack who actually are running colliders, you know, like these are theorists. They are basically taking this 19 parameter model and scanning over things and trying to calculate what the predictions are for various LHC processes. You can imagine how complicated this is, okay? All right, so here's all the data. Let me just back up and look at it. And so what does it really look like? Okay, the things with SU3 charge are really around the order of a couple TeV, again, with the caveats and the model assumptions, et cetera, okay? There are many, many new searches going on, all kinds of great stuff. I think we're gonna keep learning a lot more as more and more data from run two gets processed, okay? So what are we gonna do to try to understand this huge parameter space given the fact that we have, you know, given the fact that, you know, we have these data. So there's several things you can do. The first thing you do is just parameterize it. And you can say, look, 20 parameters, that's way too much. Let's have as some bare minimum possible. And so typical parameterization comes by a name, minimal supergravity slash CMSSM, where C stands for constraint. And the idea is now all the gauginos have a common mass, all the scalars have a common mass, all the trilinears have a common mass, Turns out the magnitude of mu gets traded to make the z mass work, but its sign can be either one. And so now we've taken our 100 and we've zeroed everything out except for four plus a sign, okay? So that's one end of the parameterization extreme. The other end is this 19 parameter thing I just talked about. And there's some other people, including John Ellis and others who are now taking simpler versions, but still 10 or 11. And basically what they're doing to do that, by the way, is instead of making everybody flavor universal, they're gonna allow different, you know, they're gonna cut down on the number of possibilities, but still, you know, allow for not just something this simple, 
Okay, so that's one set of things. Another thing you can do is, of course, just say, well, forget about the details of this huge model. Let's just think about a subset of particles that might be relevant for a particular LHC process. This is a simplified model approach. It's a very logical, natural thing to do. And then another thing you can do is say, okay, instead of just sort of saying that we're going to do these arbitrary things, let's try to build models of this stuff. And that's what I work on and I've been working on. And there are many, many things. I'm going to guide you through a couple of them. Okay, but since as usual, just like when I teach, everything takes longer than I think, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them. So at some point, I'm going to be like, Shh, sh, sh. if you want to have questions about detailed models, you can ask me. I spent many years on all these things. Okay, all right. So those are the phenomenological MSSM, the parameterization studies. And I'm just putting them up here. This is a paper from 2014 from that Slack group. And the main idea is that now they have these codes that are showing how you know, fractions of models excluded. And the point is a simplified model might give you on a certain curve, but if you allow all these parameters to vary, you know, the interpretation is much different. It's just logical. If you have more parameters, there's more ways to understand how you can evade things, okay? I mean, it's, it, there's nothing unexpected. It just shows you that you have to be a little bit careful judging too much from sort of something from a simplified model or an m sugra CMSSM, okay? All right, now let's talk about supersymmetry breaking. Okay, and like I said, the Higgs mass will turn out to be a major, major constraint here. Here's the corrections to the Higgs mass that are happening in the MSSM. Okay, so we have the tree level result, and it's well known in the, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model at tree level because there the quarter coupling is actually predicted. It's related to a gauge coupling. That's what supersymmetry does. Okay, then what ends up happening is that the tree level value of the Higgs mass is actually predicted to be less than, at or less than the Z mass, which is obviously a no. Okay, so it's long been known that there need to be big radiative corrections, and fortunately there actually are because the tree level stuff doesn't include the top core Kyukawa, but the loops do. Okay, and so then the basic idea is you need to basically satisfy that these corrections give you 125 GeV, and the general lesson we're going to see is that the sort of minimal set of things that people have done generally don't do that because the 125 GeV is accommodate, it can be accommodated within the MSSM, but it's not, quote, the most natural value. Most natural value would be something where, you know, these things can all be sort of reasonably accessible, et cetera, similar orders of magnitude, and it just isn't going to do it. Okay, it's on the edge. Okay, it's interesting though because it's on the edge, right? It's just on the edge enough to make you think, well, maybe this is sort of the right thing, but it's not right in the natural place, and it also doesn't, you know, as we'll see, this same parameter regime is also kind of in a different edge for different paradigms. So as I was talking about earlier, this 125 GeV is sort of an interesting value because it doesn't sort of say, well, this paradigm isn't going to work. It sort of is within the, the cusp for just for many things, okay? Which is interesting in its own way, right? But it's not pointing us in a particular direction. Now let me comment to basically have this kind of thing, you know, included and to um, satisfy the various bounds, there's two general classes of the scenarios, and this is probably the main takeaway point. One is that you have a heavy mass spectrum, heavy to make these things big enough to make the Higgs work out, or heavy in a split way where maybe everybody with SU3 color is very, very heavy, and the other things, the electroweak charged objects can be lighter because they're not as important for this stuff, okay? The other is the idea that this thing is compressed, Compressed means you have a lot of degeneracies and then various bounds can be evaded, right? Because the decay products are soft and it's hard to see them. Okay, so those are the two strategies. Okay, and so how do you build the models? Well, there's a general paradigm that's been well known since the 80s. And the paradigm is, is that you can't just sort of write down things that couple directly to us and then have supersymmetry broken by some potential and get something that actually makes sense. What happens if you try to confine it all into here is that there's a sum rule saying that some of the partners have to be heavier but some are lighter. We don't want the partners lighter, okay? We haven't seen that, right? But it turns out, again, since the 80s it was known that if the supersymmetry breaking is sort of from some sector that's separated from us, and by that I mean there's no tree level renormalizable couplings between them, then what can happen is supersymmetry can be broken in here by some unknown dynamics. So here I'm parameterizing that by some field X. What's called FX would be some associated VEV of what's called the supersymmetry breaking component of that superfield, and that's the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking, much like a Higgs VEV is the order parameter for electroweak breaking. Okay? And then what matters in terms of the models isn't the details of what's happening in here, 
but actually the way in which the fact that supersymmetry is broken is actually communicated to this one. It can happen, for example, through operators that are either suppressed at a tree level, for example, in gravity. You can have all kinds of interactions through gravity that are suppressed by the Planck mass, right? But they're at tree level, they're happening. Or you can have loop level gravitational corrections. And you can also have things which are not gravity suppressed, but instead are suppressed via loop factors. And gauge mediation is one of these things. Okay, and so when people were first thinking, oh, supersymmetry, we've got it, this is gonna do everything for us, you know, you have minimal versions of all this stuff. Minimal supergravity, minimal gauge mediation, et cetera. Okay, and so I have here the snow mass points and slopes from 2001 because I remember very well, you know, the time in which we sort of got together and organized what should be standard benchmarks to use to look at this stuff, okay? And so here we have various points. So these are like minimal supergravity ones. Here's a M. Sugra like one. You know, here's a gauge mediation, here's anomaly. And then there was also not just certain point values, but also saying, look, maybe we can vary some of these things by saying, okay, I can vary one of the parameters and have them rest related. And if I take a certain value for that, that gives me one, this particular point, for example. Okay, and so, you know, this was sort of the main name of the game when I was a young person. And so it was kind of like, okay, Cool. This gives us some way to map out different possibilities. I think it was clear none of them should have been taken extremely seriously as some sort of like, this must be the world, but it was just some way to navigate the possibilities. And the reason why they're important is that they have different phenomenological signatures. The different mediation mechanisms tend to have different patterns of the masses eventually at low energies, and that means you're gonna have different types of signals to see at the collider. And that's what makes them valuable. It's not so much that this mediation mechanism we think is much more theoretically important than some other one. That doesn't matter. If they all give the same exact type of signatures, then that's all we really care about, right? So what happens in run one? that happens is something very simple, which is that the Higgs mass actually rules out all of this stuff except for one of them, independently of any of the direct search limits on anything, okay? Which is quite something, okay, if you think about it. The reason why is that this is telling us something about what the stops have to be doing, okay? And so what's interesting about this is that you can actually make a rather strong statement. And I'll talk about this one here, and then I'm probably gonna skip to near the end and talk about composite Higgs just so I can have a chance to do it. Okay, there are many more of these Susie models. I'm happy to talk about it. In yeah. 2001, didn't we know how to find GPD for the precision electroweak? No, I think we did not know that. I think what we did know was that- When did we know? When did we know that it should be- When did we know and what did we know? I think what we knew, right, was that there was something that was in a certain range. And I remember there was that parabola thing that was skewed over. And it sort of was suggesting that something was going to be below a certain value. But I don't think we knew exactly 125. No, no, and we never knew exactly. Yeah. But, but, uh, that was, I think, post -level precision electro week. Well, that's 2001, but most people you had quite a bit of information. Yeah, but I think part of why, it, okay, I can, I wasn't asking. I think it was about less than 150. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, less than 150. Yeah, less than 150. Yeah, 169 had even. Well, how does 150 work on that graph? Oh, so, okay, hold on. Oh, it does matter. It matters. Yeah. Yeah. It matters a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, anyway, I mean, the point is once you pin it down, it sort of slices out very particular things. And because if you actually stare at these numbers, what you see is masses here, except for a couple of exceptions here where they let certain TeV scales creep in. These are hundreds of GeV because this was sort of the idea that we're connecting this sector together with the, electro with, with the electroweak symmetry breaking sector. So we want 100 GeV scale, not something much, much bigger that you're gonna then have to get some cancellation at some degree to give you back the Z mass of 90 GeV or whatever. Right? So that was, the, that was the prejudice for a long time. I thought, this, this must be something like this. Right? It's, it's really that way, and I think back then, right, this was sort of right, 2001. So I guess post-LEP, people were thinking maybe the Higgs is 115. Again, you go back to this picture, and what's gonna happen? You lower it down, you're gonna allow for different possibilities. Right? So, okay, let me just talk about how in minimal gauge mediation, okay, you can even make a stronger statement the fact that you need this large stop masses or stop mixing actually tells you that minimal gauge mediation, which is some idea that gauge loops in here, okay? Basically, there were benchmarks here from snow mass 2001 based on this paradigm, all right? But then it's not just that these benchmarks were ruled out. You can actually make a much stronger statement in these theories, which is that basically here, 
these trilinear scalar couplings are negligible at the input scale. And what that means in practice is stop mixing is very small in all these models. And what that meant, and people worked on this before the announcements of Higgs, of course, 125 was rumoring around, right? For those of us not allowed to know officially what's actually happening in the LHC, you know, people were whispering, okay, maybe, I don't know, right? And so basically what these plots are basically showing is that if you want in minimal gauge mediation to get 125 GV, you have to basically push parameters off into some corner, okay? It's very, very hard to get that there. Okay, and so you don't get big enough stop mixing, so to get the Higgs mass to be heavy enough, you need to make everybody super duper heavy, enormously heavy, tens of TeV heavy. Okay, and so you can say, oh, this is bad news for this whole framework, and it is. But one way that people have explored to see, okay, can we still have this gauge mediation mechanism is you can say, well, there's non-minimal ways to talk about it, and one of them is to allow for these messengers that usually are just there to communicate standard model gauge loops between these two things to allow them to have couplings to the matter, okay? And in fact, I'm going to have a whole seminar on this tomorrow. Okay, so let me say no more about this. But the answer is what you can do is you can get bigger stop mixing this way at the price of more model building complication. That's the lesson from all the supersymmetry stuff that I'm going to talk about today and all the stuff I'm about to skip because I'm out of time. And I know there's a bus. People, we were talking about that in the refreshment break. There's a bus, and so it's like, it's not like in other conferences where you can just go on forever until people actually physically throw you off the stage, which I've been known to do. So anyway, I will continue. But if you want to hear more about this, I'm talking about it, and it's going to be informal, sort of mainly chalkboard and show you a few figures sort of things, which I hope will be, you know, should be for a broad audience, not just those of you who are like working on exactly this stuff. Okay. Let me go on to say we can talk about gravity mediation. I just want to rush through these. This is John Ellis and his million collaborators who have been doing MSUGRA for decades now. And the idea is that look at these scales. Now, this is the gauge genome common mass and the scalar common mass. This is TeV, right? We now have 10 TeV, 20 TeV, right? This is the sort of things we're pushing. So if you think about pushing on these slopes for these minimal versions, you're pushing yourself way out, okay? And there's, in general, you can see we're gonna have this heavy split business. Let me just go on to say that what some people have tried to do is to say, look, these things don't look natural, right? Having 10 TeV squarks and then trying to say, well, that feeds into the Higgs potential through RG running of other parameters and now we're gonna get 90 GeV for the Higgs mass to come, sorry, the Z mass to come out, right? That seems like this thing we wanted supersymmetry to do isn't happening. And I would say that's true, okay? So the higher we push these things up, the more we're letting go, okay, some have it more difficult time letting go than others. We need some sort of big group therapy session where we all let go. Um, is basically we need to understand that supersymmetry as a paradigm itself is not responsible then for the electroweak symmetry breaking scale to be the size that it is. It's that perhaps plus some other ingredient that allows that to happen, okay, okay. My colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues in Madison, Vernon Barger, he and his collaborators are trying to say, look, I can define naturalness in a different way. What they want is for the Higgs potential itself to have no cancellations, okay? Remember, fine tuning and naturalness are subjective ideas. What kind of tuning do you think is okay? This is partly why it's so hard to sort of get a firm handle on what people are actually believing because it's subjective, right? There's not like, this is what fine tuning is but this other thing is not. No, it can be whatever you interpret it to be. And so what these people are saying is, look, if I want to make sure that all the terms are similar, right, then what's gonna happen is it prefers certain types of models, and in general what you're gonna have are a very predictive spectrum, and they call this radiative natural supersymmetry. And they have a criterion that they call delta electroweak, and that's what this thing is here. And so the point is they want this criteria, which is related to this cancellation aspect here, they don't want too much cancellation, they're gonna look for places where that thing is small and then they're gonna say, that's quote, natural, okay? And then they can say, see, naturalness isn't dead. We can look for it at the LHC because what's gonna happen? Lightish hexenos, we have sort of this kind of stuff, okay, et cetera. I think it's perfectly fine to define things in this way. We just have to understand this is the context in which you're thinking about it. Say so this is one scenario out of many that you can try to test at the LHC, okay? Now, let me skip this one. And let me just comment very briefly, like generally, what do we want to have either sort of light enos and ultra-heavy fermions? The slide I just skipped was a sort of 
general paradigm to get the compressed stuff. I can return to that later if people are interested. Okay, and so there's many ways people have looked at. Another one is top down from Gordy Kane, and he's pushing very hard on this other idea about some string motivated stuff. Okay, but the upshot is that there's you have to get into this pattern that's not at all what people have initially envisioned, right? And whenever you have start having very heavy scales, you have to understand why is there a hierarchy of these scales if there is such a thing? And how does it feed into the Higgs potential and why is the electroweak symmetry scale coming out where it is? And the answer is it's not what we thought it was with 100 GeV superpartners back in the early days. Whatever it is, it's not that. That's the lesson that we have to take away. But I would say given that, given that this is an interesting paradigm, we should be exploring to the best extent that we can how we can test this paradigm at the LHC. And one of the ways to do that is to look at these various possibilities and make sure we've done everything we can. And as I said, experimentals are doing an amazing job with many searches and many approaches. We want to make sure that we're covering every possible thing. And from a theory point of view, I like to look at these different things, not necessarily to say, oh, okay, maybe there's some thing that they're not only looking for. Most likely, your already, searches are already covering a lot of this stuff. The question is, if you learn some particular thing from your search, what then can you learn from the theoretical side about it? Okay? All right. So that's the Susie business, and this is the summary of it. And since now I don't have any more time, this is the main lesson. Okay? We have much more work to test this paradigm, okay? Although I would say, much like the other paradigm I'm going to talk about, we don't have some sort of knee-jerk, it's this paradigm that's giving us the quote natural Higgs mass. Okay? Let me talk briefly about, very briefly, I promise, about composite Higgs. The idea here, as I said, is uh, Higgs is a pseudo Goldstone boson. Okay? And so here's the idea, right? And we've seen this idea before. For example, pi n can be thought of as pseudo Nambu Goldstone bosons associated with the chiral symmetry of the quark sector in QCD. So here's some picture, or here's all the resonance, the heavy resonances, and there's the pions, much lighter because they're an approximate Goldstone boson. Okay? So now what do we have to do? The idea is you posit some strongly coupled sector with some high scale, some scale, right? And then the, you say this sector has some global symmetry that's broken to a subgroup. Okay? And so what you want is that in this, you know, you want to gauge the electroweak sub symmetry breaking group in terms of this subgroup H. So it's this sort of this combination over here. And so the big group breaks to the subgroup, and then we have this overlap here. And so then the Goldstone boson associated with this breaking of G to H then can be associated with the Higgs of the standard model. Okay? And so we need to give that thing a mass. So this G has to also have explicit breaking. This makes things a little bit more complicated. Okay? There's many, many models. Okay, they're all pretty Baroque, right? But I would say the same is true from those Susie models I was telling you now in the sort of post-run one LHC era, they're Baroque too. So I think we're all, you know, many things are on similar footing here. The point is you have to have a big global symmetry because you need to fit the standard model gauge symmetry within it, within the subgroup of what's broken, what's broken too. Okay, this is an old chart. There's probably a chart the size of this page now with all the different ideas people have looked at. And the main idea is that you need the Higgs vacuum expectation value to be much smaller than this natural scale associated with the strong dynamics. This is basically how Technicolor is coming back. Technicolor is coming back, not by saying that Higgs is a composite object made out of bound state of fermions. That was a, already a problem. But instead, we say, look, there's a strong dynamics at some scale. We're going to now have this thing of the symmetry. We're going to have this actual scalar particle as a pseudo Goldstone boson. And so what's going to happen is that's going to be some sort of effective theory. We get a radiative Higgs potential. And then eventually what's going to happen to finally unitarize W, scattering, et cetera, is going to be that the strong dynamics are going to come in and take over. So you're pushing this technicolor scale back. That's basically the idea. Whereas the Higgs itself just unitarizes the WW scattering. We know this, right? These things aren't going to quite do it. It's going to push it off, and then something else is going to come in and take over. OK? Now, let me just comment, there's some complication, as is usually true with any of these ideas when you try to introduce the fermions, okay? And basically, the issue becomes really how the top partners come, and there's two different classes of models. One is that the top partners are also QCD-charged objects, just like the top, or you can make other models, which are even more complicated, where those things are actually singlets under QCD, but there's some charge under some what they call mirror group, some other sector, okay? And then the reason why this is something of interest is we don't have limits on those guys. So that means you can have so court natural without having any sort of, you know, detailed, you know, limit on what those partners are. All right, 
Let me be quick. The main issue is that here's all the Higgs couplings. There's three parameters, A, B, C. This is written in terms of Goldstone modes. Okay? So Higgs model, this is basically the set of things you get. And this makes vector boson scattering fully unitarized. But composite Higgs is not true. You're going to be deviating by this is this, this C parameter is V squared over F squared. And so if you could measure all these couplings in this sort of effective Lagrangian extremely well, which is not such an easy prospect, but it's something people are trying to do, you can learn as to whether you're going to have this sort of limit or something more like this. OK, almost done. Let me just comment that if you want to have the top partners be neutral under the standard model, what you have are these sort of mirror sectors. And this goes by the name of twin Higgs. Okay? And there's a lot of interesting model building gymnastics that goes on, but ultimately the main issue is that there's ideas that these things are called neutral naturalness. So if you ever see that label, that's what you have here. And mainly there, there's just going to be the Higgs coupling deviations. You're not going to see the partners because the partners don't have QCD charge, so you're not going to be so easily to see them from a Hadron Collider. Okay? All right. And so there's various different ways you can try to test these things. But let me get to the summary here. Much, much more work, just like with supersymmetry, to test this thing thoroughly. And I think that's basically our job. Let me just conclude extremely briefly. I've already said all these things, so let me just finish it. Okay? As general frameworks, these are both alive and testable. These are basically saying we have more complicated things. The quote, nat most natural quote things, I would say, we already know that ship has sailed. Okay? Nonetheless, as frameworks for what could be happening in any of these sectors, we can test some of these things and we can move forward. And these are not the only two possibilities. There's dozens of others I haven't had times to talk about. Okay? It could, of course, be that, and I think it's likely, in fact, we should be thinking differently. Right? Instead of thinking, we've got to make natural, right? It's just so attractive. Remember, there's that compelling picture of the tippy top standing up or the pencil or whatever. Maybe we have to be thinking differently. Okay? That's testing more of our ideas about effective theory and what should be happening. Okay? But maybe we're going there. It's very possible. Okay? And indeed, if the standard model keeps triumphantly sort of galloping through everything and stays emerged like some sort of knight in the forefront of battle and it just keeps wiping everything out and being like, here we are, then that's what we're going to have to do. And it's actually interesting and exciting. And the question is, since we already know the standard model is incomplete and the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking is still mysterious, the question is, where is the new physics? What's accounting for this UV sensitivity and how do we get a handle on it? And I would say, given that it's this Higgs sector that's the mystery, the Higgs is the key. We need to study it. Okay, thank you.